it is such an honor and a pleasure to have Dana King Sculptor Artist with us this evening. And the beautiful Frederica Newton. come to hear from me, so I will just say that documentary that you just saw has already won an award and is nominated for an NAACP Image Award in March. So I will give it to Okay. You're taking the time to come and see our film. Every time we watch it, it it's really emotional for us and uh, as you might imagine we've seen it we've seen it a couple times <laughs> if you were short like me freddie that yeah, wouldn't be a problem <laughs> but you're not <laughs> um how should we start i just love that film i don't uh, ever get tired of watching it i tell Dana, you know i think i've watched about 10 or 20 times those are just the times that i um that I admit to, but yeah, that film is very emotional. It, um, let's see, how should we talk? Should we talk about how? Maybe how we started it? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, my name's Frederica Newton, and Huey was my husband. And Huey was the co founder of the Black Panther Party, which started in Oakland in 1966. And since 1966, there you go. <laughs> Dana's repping. Um, this this party became the leading of an international movement. It wasn't just local to Oakland, but was internationally impactful. But there was nothing in Oakland that nothing that permanently marked the presence of the Black Panther Party in any way other than murals that community members had done. The city of Oakland had done nothing to commemorate the legacy of this of this powerful organization. And so, um, in, um, now it's gonna be 30 years of, in next year that I co-founded the Dr. Huey P. Newton Foundation, which was to preserve and promote the legacy of the Black Panther Party. And we decided to, on, on the, um, space where Huey died on that street, we were to rename that street Dr. Huey P. Newton Way, but on that very place where he had taken his last breath, there was not even a plaque there. So we decided that um, something needed to be done to mark that, that very sacred space. And I thought of a plaque, and I uh, went around the corner from where he, where that, where the site was and to a a place that um, deals in metal art, and I told them what I wanted to do, and they didn't know who Huey was. So of course I said, well, they're not the people to do this. <laughs> and I called Dana King. Um, Dana and I had met earlier because we also have a plan to create a Black Panther Party National P Art, Black Panther Party sculpture to commemorate the whole legacy of the Black Panther Party. And I had spoken with Dana a few months prior to that to ask her if she could do this plaque. And <laughs> so I got a prize for the plaque. And, and this was still in the concept that it would be on the ground. And, and we agreed that the ground was not the place for, for a plaque for Huey. And so I thought, well, I'll, we'll stand one up, kind of like a sandwich board. and. Uh, and then I called the foundry and I got prices and then I called Frederick and I said, you know, Freddie, for the price of this plaque, I can create a bust of Huey. And Frederick said, let's do it. And uh, from there, it, it, Frederick has an entire team of people uh, who participate in, in the foundation. None of them really knew it. We just kind of went freelancing. And we went rogue. <laughs> we went rogue. <laughs> And, uh, and created this bust. And the people in the community protect him. 
They commune with him, they leave him flowers, they leave him candles, they love having him there. And uh, in the making of the bust, um, you saw my studio, um, and Panthers came by, Huey's barber, Diamond Ken, came through and helped me with that fro, because Huey was very particular about it, and I did not want to mess it up. Uh, Fred Hampton Jr. out of Chicago, whose father was murdered by the Chicago police and the FBI, uh, who's, who was infiltrated by, um, by a rat, and uh, who told, him, told them the location of his bed and everything in his room when he was murdered. And Fred Jr. continues his legacy. He came in from Chicago with his crew. And uh, we wanted this to be deep community engagement because the Panthers were for the community. And I think that um, what, as an artist, my hope is, is that people who may not know, or let's say they come upon the sculpture accidentally, or intentionally, the education is the same. So my hope for my work is that people will dig deeper into the history of the person being honored in statuary, but also dig into their own history. We all have family history here. I can only go back as far as my great-grandparents who were enslaved out of South Carolina. Um, but it's important history. Um, we deserve to know where we come from. And this is, this is part of that legacy. We, um, when I say that the city of Oakland didn't commemorate the party, there were many children and adults that didn't know their own history, that knew very little about the Black Panther Party through no fault of their own. Um, they didn't, it's not in any textbook. So, um, you know, generations have grown up without knowing their history. So we thought it was very important to uh, place some of that history on the, on the front of that, that plaque. And, um, oh gosh, there was something I was gonna say. Now I've, I've forgotten it. I, oh. When we talk about art, art and activism, when we, the Black Panther Party had a newspaper. The Black Panther Party ended formally uh, in 1982. For 13 years, we had a newspaper, the Black Panther Party news, Black Panther Party newspaper, basically. And on the back of every one of those newspapers, if you, if you research this, if you Google, you'll see that there was art, art on the back of the paper, primarily done by um, our Minister of Culture, Emory Douglas, who is a world-renowned artist, but there were also other artists, um, women artists, uh, Sally Dixon and others, who contributed to that artwork. The artwork wasn't merely artwork, it was what we call the revolutionary art, because and through those illustrations, because we knew that the black community wasn't necessarily a reading community, but that, and that the information had to be concise. So we would have images of police and oppression and, and um, there were 65 survival programs. So we would illustrate those survival programs. One of them being, many of you know, the free breakfast for children program. There was free sickle cell anemia testing. There were free health clinics. Babies were dying from lead in the paint. The, the old Victorians in Oakland are old and there was lead based paint, lead is sweet. So babies were dying and getting really sick from eating that lead-based paint. There was no testing. Do you know in North Carolina, um, two women Panthers created free ambulance programs because the ambulances weren't coming into the black community, so black people were dying in their homes. So they learned how to be EMTs and got a hearse donated and started driving the ambulance in, in the black community and taking people to the hospitals. So these illustrations would demonstrate the work that the party was doing to serve the people in their communities. And so I knew that it was really important to continue that, to continue representing activism through art. And, um, and that's what, this is just the first, this is just the first piece that we plan to do. We're working on with the National Park to create National Park, Black Panther Party National Park. 
because this is an american story and that's the job of the national park service to tell the american story so we want to create a black panther party national park comprised of different urban sites in oakland in the bay area to um, show the work that the black panther party did um, i just January, and last month we opened in Oakland, in a very prominent, not prominent, it's right downtown Oakland, which is historically significant um, to the party because on that corner we sold newspapers, the Black Panther Party newspapers. Um, we've opened the Black Panther Party, Black Panther Party Museum. So I welcome you to research it, look it up, Black Panther Party, at Black Panther Party on Instagram and blackpantherpartymuseum.com. Um, so you can see since we opened the doors, it's been just inundated with schools. And I don't even know how these people knew it was going to open because the very first day we had three groups from, from different schools there. So people are hungry for this knowledge. People, people, people of all ages, if you can't walk out the door in Oakland without somebody having a personal story about the Black Panther Party, either they were fed, their father, as a matter of fact, raise your hands here, anybody that has any, any contact or any his, history in your family, you're not from Oakland. Because in Oakland, everybody does. There's, if you think about it, you knew somebody, okay, there you go. Somebody had, there you go. Somebody knew somebody, somebody was fed in the breakfast program, somebody's uncle was in the breakfast, you know, served in the party. This is a very personal story. And um, I don't walk out the door one day in Oakland or in New York or in DC or in North Carolina without somebody having a story of the Black Panther Party. And the one thing that I want to say is that I really hope that we convey that the Black Panther Party, in, in, which is not at all what you saw the images that you saw in the newspapers, which is why we created our own, was it was the Black Panther Party was based on the foundation of love. The Black Panther Party wanted to serve their community out of love. These the average age was 19 years old, and these young men and women laid down their lives out of love for their community. We worked in coalition with all like-minded groups. There was also propaganda that we were a racist organization it's not true we had an asian <laughs> no we had asian alliances and even membership in the party we even worked with a group called the young patriots where they had they carried the confederate flag and they but they were there to they their mission was the same to fight oppression they were poor white folks and they faced this the same mach, oppressive machine that we did by the time that we met, they put down their, their um, Confederate flag and picked up the banner of the Black Panther Party. So there's a lot to learn, and there's a lot that hasn't been accessed. And that's what we're doing at the Black Panther Museum, Black Panther Party Museum, so that you can know this history and know that it really, really was a legacy of love. I want to double down on that, because the government has made sure that we do not learn this history. Not the history of the Panthers, not the truth about enslavement, not the, the list is long, right? Um, I mean, think about the organization MOVE in Philadelphia, the entire block was blown up for what? People were killed for what? I mean, it's, it's, it continues today. There's a file on this woman, been a file on this woman. Um, we're still careful on the phone about what we say. Um, it's, it's, it's unending. And um, we're witnessing it here in Florida. The truth of, of the history of African descendants in this country is being withheld. It's being censored, if told at all. And it's not just Florida. It's happening all over the country. Florida may lead the way, um, but it needs to stop. And one of the ways it stops is we tell our stories differently in, and with different materials. We're not all uh, visual, or we're not all uh, auditory, we're not all um, um, 
learners based on writing. Many of us, I'm a visual learner, and, and it encourages me to dig deeper in other ways and other formats of learning. And, um, and that's what this is. And that's what Frederica is doing, is reaching people where they are so that they can learn this history. I know that black churches here in Florida, just like it happened in the Civil Rights South, are, are giving lessons, they're, having, they're educating people in the basements of the churches so that our children know the truth. As enslaved people, it was against the law for us to learn to read and write. But we did, didn't we? So we will find a way out of no way, because we always have. And this alliance, Frederick is not kidding, people are hungry for this information. And it's stunning, most of us had to learn it when we were grown, adults. I didn't learn it in school, I'm 64. I didn't learn it. Um, you know, they paraded the same black folks in front of us every uh, Black History Month. We never went to a museum as a kid. My mom was a single mom. Um, the only trip we took as a, as a school was to the bread factory because that's what they thought of us. We could be, we could be um, workers, you know. And um, it didn't encourage our our confidence. It didn't encourage our intelligence. It didn't encur encourage our our connectedness. And what this country has tried to do and has done successfully and continues to do is to separate us. In addition to the yellow peril that, that the um, Panthers worked with and the Patriots, they worked with um, lesbian and gay people at the time. They worked with, um, they worked with Native Americans. They worked with uh, feminists. Uh, poor whites, in addition to the patriots. And that's the fear that the government had, was that we would all sit down at the same table and realize that we were all being oppressed in the same way. And that tables look just like this. That's right, tables look just like this pack, mm -hmm. right? And that, and that fear is the same today. We are being intentionally divided. And Frederica, you said it, the, Pan the Panthers were not, they didn't hate white people. They were not, um, they were not nationalists. They were, they were not xenophobic. They were inclusive. And all we ever hear about them was that, you know, they, they carried guns and they killed people. The Panthers started as the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Tell them the history of the animal of the panther. Um, the reason why that was chosen was because a panther never strikes first. They only defend themselves. So, um, and that the reason, what, well actually one of our first programs was to protect black people, or people in the community who were being, mostly black people, who were being brutalized by the police. So Huey used to go out, Huey and Bobby, who were the co-founders at 24 years old, used to go out into the community with a law book because Huey was a law student, he was in law school. A law book in one hand and a rifle in the other because time it was legal. And he would, he would tell people their rights so that, and to protect them so that they would not be brutalized in those Oakland streets. They, the, Oakland, the OPD, Oakland Police Department, recruited the police officers from down south to come there and serve in the force. And there were no black officers at the time. They were all white and they were all southern. So, and they also protected school children, little black kids, where the city wouldn't put a stoplight at a certain place where the elementary school kids were walking across the street. So they would get out there in their berets and their leather jackets. You don't see pictures of this of them walking and acting as crossing guards, making sure that these kids were, were safe when they were going across the streets. They would, they created a program called SAFE, Seniors 
against a fearful environment where we would um, make sure that the seniors were able to get to banks safely, get go to get, get their meds from the pharmacies, get to banks and cash their checks in, in safety. But on, honestly, there were 65 survival programs that m most people only know of one or two. And this is the work that we did. When I say, you see this brother in the picture on the cover of a, a newspaper with a gun, but you don't see him at five o'clock in the morning feeding children in a room like this. Those aren't the images that you saw. There was a time when 70% of the membership of the Black Panther Party were women, and almost all of the leadership was women. You don't know this. This was not known. Um, ma mainstream media made it a point not to show this. So there's, we, and we knew we couldn't do this alone. I, was, I mentioned it a little bit in the film. Um, my mother was Jewish, and the way that I met Huey was I'd gone away to school, I grew up in an activist family, I was, did what a whole lot of teenagers do, is rebel against their parents, I was not interested in that, show me some cute outfits, or <laughs> that, I was more interested in you know that kind of thing. And I, when I came home from college, my mother said, um, Huey Newton is coming for lunch. He had, my neighbors had taken me to see him that day when he was released from prison. And what struck me was the diversity in the crowd. And I went away to school and like a month later, and I came back home at Christmas time. My mother, who was a Jewish realtor who worked her whole entire life against racist practices in the real estate, um, field, the Black Panther Party trusted her to be their realtor. And so when I came home, there was Huey in my, in my uh, dining room. So I'm, I'm, I think what enabled me to, to join the party and what brought me close to Huey was the fact that I didn't have to um, be at war with myself around the fact that during a time that was very polarized, either you were black or white, you couldn't be both, um, that I didn't have to apologize for my mother or this side of my family. So I could not have been a part of an organization that was racist at its foundation. And so um, it's, that's just one of the many, 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 what's the word? the way that the, the government painted the Black Panther Party in ways that was, was just not true. So, um, I think, yeah, I was gonna say. You were right there. <laughs> um, we'd like to open this up for questions. If anybody has any, we'd be happy to answer. Don't be shy. But you gotta come get this microphone. No. <laughs> uh, we do, you, in the film, you talked about Huey's vulnerability and his love. Could you just tell a story about some moment that, about his vulnerability and love? Um, I, the, I, it didn't come across really well in the film, I don't think, but that, that day, you know, the first day that I met him, um, and I was not political. I was, you know, just coming into my own started reading books in college um, that I had never read before. Franz Fanon and Richard Wright and um, Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez and listening to jazz. And um, so I was just you know, starting to come into my own. But these people that were in the house were young students. They were, they were intellectuals, they were activists, and they were asking these really deep political, ideological questions that you know, I, I, did, I had no knowledge of. But I was really interested in who this guy was. Like, who is he? I don't, I've seen him on these iconic photos that I know you all know, Huey in the wicker chair. It was on everybody's wall. And um, who was he? And so the, it, it became clear that I hadn't interacted with him. I was you know, just flitting around and emptying ashtrays. And um, so being the hostess daughter, I, I asked him, um, could you tell me um, what it was like for you in prison? And um, so he put down in his he put down his fork and um, and he gave it a lot of thought. 
And I, I was embarrassed, I had this little simple question to ask, but then he, he looked up and he said, um, she was very lonely there. And it was something about the attention that he gave to that question and the thought and that he would consider this young girl, I was 19, I just turned 19, um, that he gave such consideration to that, to that simple question that really moved me. Um, and Huey had a, I mean, he had a, he was funny. He was a really funny dude. He was one of those guys that um, he would tell some corny joke and it wasn't funny, but people would like uh, laugh and I said, you know, maybe that's, you got that all wrong. I mean, the words weren't. He said, like, um, I can Tina Turner's song, Proud Mary. He said, man, them primaries, they keep on rolling them primaries. And the brothers would say, yeah, brother, they had them primaries. He said, primaries? It's a proud Mary. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. He, I don't know. He, he couldn't have a horrible sense of direction. So I got a license plate that said, lost in a lost world. <laughs> he just didn't know. Either he just ain't going the general direction of where we think we're supposed to go. And, it's a funny thing because men and women had a different response to him. Like if we'd be out in the street, black women didn't matter the age. Usually older black women, more senior black women, would you know talk to him like he was their child. Hey, what are you doing? He, one time he was looking for the PG&E, the gas, where you pay your gas bill. And like, now you know this bill, this bill that has not, that has not been here for 10 years. No, I don't know why you're here. You know, it would talk to him like that where men would, you know, have a different response to him. So people, um, he, he was, he was funny and he was at his best with kids. He was like a Pied Piper with kids. And I think kids really know the essence of somebody. So I had a son when we got married and we were, our house was always full of children. And um, we really tried our best to make it like a normal family under abnormal circumstances. He was taken to prison. He was, our house was raided by the police more than once, turned upside down. Both times I just left them in there. Let, we just shut the door and let them, left the police in the house. Um, so we take pictures at the Capwell's, Sears, you know, photo studio, just anything to, to cobble together a little normal life. And um, he would indulge me in those things. I remember the one time I, the, we had an old Mercedes, and he, he loved that car. And I, I, it needed water, I thought. So I poured it in the engine. Something, yeah. And, it's, <laughs> and people thought, oh, girl. He just said, that's my bride. <laughs> so it's easy. It was really easy in that way. And, and he was the theoretician of the Panthers. And that put him in the spotlight. Well, he didn't want to be. He didn't want that role. But ended up being the spokesperson for the Panthers um, because he was brilliant. Brilliant. That PhD he has is real. Um, uh, Santa Barbara? Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. UC Santa, Santa Cruz. So that's, that was real. He's authored four, five books um, that you can find um, through Amazon if you like. But yes, he, he, he earned his degree after he came back from, he was in exile in Cuba for three years and then he came back. He got a doctorate philosophy and history of consciousness, I think. So the Panthers came into being at a time when activism was widely done. The John Lewis's, the um, Ella Baker's, the uh, MLK's, the, the uh, I mean, it, pick one. I mean, but they watched that activism 
and they watch things very slowly change. And, you know, we had the Civil Rights Act of 64 that allowed us to buy our own homes in any, the, any neighborhood we wanted to, but then they rolled in redlining, right? So we, we get a step forward and they have to take five back. But the Panthers came into that watching leadership and watching people engage in, in what is theirs rightfully to have and to do and to be in this country. And we don't have that now. And I feel like there is a a complacency of hopelessness that we vote, we sometimes vote against our best interest, sometimes we vote because we have no one else to vote for. Um, and we hope that they will see us and help us, uh, not help us, that they will do the right thing on behalf of us. And it doesn't happen, and it doesn't happen. And yet we have to vote again, and again. And, you know, that, that, that weighs on a person, it weighs on a people. You know, when we watch our, our children get killed in the streets, gunned down, run down, for jaywalking, selling single cigarettes, um, eating candy, playing in the playground with a little toy gun, just like the little kids do. It's hard not to be complacent in our hopelessness. And we gotta shake it off. We got we have to, we have to shake this off because Power is in the people, and the Panthers knew that. And they encouraged that, and they facilitated a way to make that happen for people, for, for people to join together and to feel safe in, their, in that grouping. We need to find that again. And that's all I got. You know, I think the reason why I had that response, like, I don't want to talk about that, was because I'm, you know, I'm sitting here thinking 1966, 1971, that's where my head is tonight. And I'm thinking about the 28 members of the Black Panther Party that were killed by the police. I'm thinking about that COINTELPRO that turned husbands and wives against each other because he didn't know who was an agent and who wasn't. I'm thinking about the fact that at 19 years old, we didn't know if we were going to live 24 hours, so we lived in the moment. And I'm thinking about how these 19-year-olds now are 75 and 74, and how so many of my comrades suffer and have suffered all these years so much from post-traumatic whatever as a result of living their lives like that for many years because we were literally in foxholes as our comrades got gunned down and had no place to go for relief. Who can you trust to go to get help from um, when you are a veteran member of a revolutionary organization like the Black Panther Party? So one of the things that we didn't do well because we didn't have the leisure, was to take care of ourselves. We didn't take care of ourselves spiritually. We didn't know. We didn't, we didn't know that we even needed to. We didn't have any balance. There was no recreation. We just got up at five in the morning till wee hours of the night and worked. When we weren't feeding kids in the morning, we wrapped it up by packaging newspapers over in district, central distribution over in San Francisco at night. And then we come home and live communally, we all live communally, and find a corner of some room to sleep on. 
So it was hard for me to like talk about what we did wrong. And we didn't do it all right. I mean, we did our best. We were kids. We did the best we could. We wanted to turn this whole thing upside down. We wanted to redefine what relationships look like. And in the process, families were separated. Kids were raised in a school rather than raised in their family in the Black Panther Party. All the, because we were working 24, 24. All the children were put together. So families were broken apart, but we didn't know any better. So I'd say that we can learn from our, from our victories and definitely learn from our mistakes. It's taken this long for party members to come together and talk about this stuff. Where people, um, Erica Huggins, who was one of the leaders in the Black Panther Party and director of the Oakland Community School, which is our current exhibition at the Black Panther Party Museum, one of them, wrote a book. She didn't write it, she got a collect collective of 50 uh, veteran Black Panther Party women, women, men, yeah, women, and she traveled across the states where these women could finally tell their stories. They've been silent all these years, so they could tell their stories. And it's, it's, it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful book, it's called Comrade Sisters, which you can get it on Amazon. And you, you see these women and they tell these incredible stories of what they did in the party and how it's impacted their lives and the work that they're doing now. So it's, it's been over 50 something years of healing for, for folks um, because these people were hunted well beyond when they left the party in their 20s. It's impacted their lives since, since the 60s. So when I think about what we did wrong, mm, I'd like to think about the fact that these people, um, we've passed the torch on, and that um, we're here to share what, what we could have done better and how, how we did our very best in doing what we did. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanna thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're raising your hands. It's a complacency of hopefulness. We've been fed so few morsels that when we get them, we hang on to them and become, become complacent. Um, I think it's important that we honor the Black Panthers because that movement gave our community, black, white, polka dot, black color, a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment, and so many other organizations sprung off from them. The Black Panthers died, but other organizations that were trying to empower people rose up. And even though you didn't see the big plans that were party with the leather jackets and stuff, you saw, still saw people trying to feed kids, trying to educate them, trying to teach them black history. And it continues, and it's almost like we're looking for this big, bright one person or one organization to do it when we're all responsible. We're responsible for what we do in our communities. We're responsible for sharing the knowledge that we have. We're responsible for our churches being churches and not just places or whatever. And we're responsible for all the positiveness that comes out of it. So I, as a young woman who was in college during that time, I had my Hughes Hughes Newton sign right here. I had my Angela Davis sign right there. I had my Biggie King sign right there. And it helped me to be whatever God wanted me to be at this time. And so I now try to do everything I can to kind of force my way and inch my way in situations so I can talk about the power of blackness, so I can talk about the power of communities coming together. And I'm not trying to do it for claim or fame. I'm just trying to do it because I know this is what we should all be doing. And so it's not one person's responsibility. But I applaud the black people. Yeah.
Um, they're here, and we are here. And as we know, if we look back at from slavery, no one race, no one group did it alone. We had black and whites working together to free us. And if you look around here tonight, if we can get by, some of our, all of us have some prejudices, and then because we don't associate it is from not knowing each other. And it's profound to know that if we're gonna make changes, we all are gonna to have to do it together. Most of you said no one race can do it, no one group can do it. Hello everybody, my name is Victoria Perry. Well, my aunt and uncle told me that you guys are coming today. I, I'm a research person, so I looked up some stuff. And in the in 19, uh, 1989, in the Times article, I think it was the lawyer for Dr. Hugh P. Newton, Charles Gary. When I was reading the article, it hit me when he said uh, they destroyed Huey, him, which is Huey P. Newton, over 10 years ago. Mr. Gary said, to me, Huey died 10 years ago, and I just wanted to get some insight or how you feel about him saying that he had, he had passed 10 years ago before he was actually killed. Um, Charles, Charles Gary was one of the finest attorneys that um, represented the Black Panther Party. I, I, I'd love to know, you know how in the news they'll um, pick out a sentence. I don't know what was the context in which Charles said that. I don't know. I know that um, the United States government waged a war on Huey P. Newton and their mission was to destroy him. And I don't know anybody, I don't know anybody that could withstand the pressure that that man withstood. He had 57 trials and 50 seven acquittals um, and mistrials. So I don't, I don't know what Charles was talking about. Um, at the time that Huey died, he was battling addiction. I don't think that that's um, something that you can vilify somebody for. Um, he, it was, I remember that Huey told the judge, in one case, you've taken everything from me. You've destroyed my family. I'm not able to, we were broke. Let me just tell you a little story. The day that Huey got killed, we were planning a yard sale. I'd gone in the basement and looked at all the things that are now at Stanford University and saw photographs and I was gonna sell these photographs in a yard sale so that we could have some money. Who was gonna hire Huey Newton? And I was, had been working as a nurse and I, it was hard. I'll just say that it was really, really hard and at the county hospital. And um, so we, we, were, we were struggling. And the same people that work to get Huey free, these same people that um, would donate two dollars or seventeen dollars, or are the same people that buried Huey. When he um, died that day, when I woke up and got the news, or was awakened with the news that he'd been killed that morning, because he didn't come home that night, and I knew that I knew that something was wrong. Um, people were knocking on my door, asking what time the yard sale was going to start. So we, um, when there was an article in the paper that said we were accepting donations to help defray the funeral costs, I still have every one of those letters and notes and canceled checks from people that would walk into the bank. Sometimes we're walkers. And, um, write little checks for $5 or $7 and leave a note. I have every one of those notes. So it was the people that buried Huey and the same people that worked to free Huey. So um, I don't know what Charles was saying, but I know what the government did to this man. And I, 
I challenge anybody to go through what he did. And um, even in prison, I don't know that the same man that went into prison was the same man that went out, because I don't know what they did to him. My question for you, Dana, is that watching the film and seeing you look at the bus that you're doing, and then they had that music in the background, and you know, you're looking, you're trying to play the and, and you're touching this, and you're going, what is your muse to do these types of things in this arena, in that category of famous people? What is your muse? Obviously, for Huey, it was Frederica. Um, because she shared so intimately with me about her life and their life together. But that's a luxury that I'll probably never have again. Most of the people that I sculpt have passed long ago, and there are no living relatives or friends or acquaintances that I can speak with. Um, I've always been a history buff. I spent 25 years as a broadcast journalist. So history, it was living history then, and um, a different kind of history in, as a sculptor. My, what motivates me is to create a likeness that, that, that the person being honored would would be happy with. And that's kind of hard. <laughs> I, uh, I am a perfectionist in, in that only. That's it. Um, my work doesn't leave my studio unless I love it and, um, and can put it out in the world. I, I just finished a, a bust of Ida B. Wells for Columbia University. And, I'm, and because I have pieces at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice that chronicles the 4,000 plus um, Americans who were lynched in this country, it was because of Ida B. Wells. So, so I'm, I'm grateful for the connections that my work makes um, and, um, and, and any kind of impact it can have on someone to, to do more, to do what is theirs to do. I didn't start sculpting until I was 50 and I'm 64. And I went back to school to get my MFA in painting, and I'm a terrible painter. And I took a weekend course uh, with a master sculptor named Philippe Ferro, and I couldn't even finish the course, <laughs> the one weekend, because I was so full. And I said, I, I, I told him, I said, I just have to do this work. I gotta go, I don't have any more room in my head. I just have to do this. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, I'm about to do Ella Baker for Ohio State University. And uh, I just finished a sculpture that will be installed in San Francisco of a woman named Toni Stone, who was the first woman to play professional baseball in the Negro Leagues. And she was a badass. <laughs> they wanted her to wear a skirt. She said, take my contract, tear it up. No, she was a ball player. And so um, at the end of 2020, Major League Baseball said, oh yeah, the Negro Leagues really were Major League Baseball. <laughs> so they now have everyone's stats and, and records from the Negro Leagues in Major League Baseball. So she'll be the first. And I gotta say, the Giants might be more excited about this than me, and that's hard. That's hard to do. Um, but, as any good activist, we don't want to leave the room without asking something from you. And this is your something. The Vero Beach High School, I get their, um, their monthly newsletter. Uh, what is the name of it? 
It's in my bag. Smoke, smoke signals. Smoke signals. Thank you. And this month's smoke signals for February edition uh, 18. Uh, yeah, four. I don't know. Whatever. There's nothing in that newsletter about Black History Month. Nothing. 22% of the students at Vero Beach High School are black. 21% are Hispanic. Black and brown is the majority there, and there is nothing that was discussed on their behalf. So I called the principal's office today and asked to speak to him. Of course, he wasn't there. I talked to his admin, and she had all kinds of excuses. Well, you know, <laughs> We ask for volunteers to write articles and send us information about what's going on around school. I said, oh, I'm sure that's hard, because, right, every month you gotta do that. I said, but the principal writes this every month, and he didn't need anybody to write it for him. It was his job to write about Black History Month, and he didn't. In a state with amazing Hero, heroines and heroes of black history. There's nothing that he wrote. So, so what I want to ask of you is that if you would, um, he's easy to find. His name is uh, Sean Oki. And um, if you know him, please talk to him. Um, if, if you don't know him, please send him an email or even if you don't, send them an email. Because that's unacceptable. How are our children gonna feel welcome and have a sense of belonging in their own high school if the, if the month that is our history month isn't even mentioned? And the answer is they're not. So I, uh, I'm asking you if you would engage in that way, thank you. Round of applause. Thank you all for coming. Have a great evening.